Uh, first, ladies and gentlemen, I am an MLA, but I'm not here as an MLA. When I was first elected eight years ago, uh, Shirley McConnell was our Deputy Premier and Minister of Agriculture, and she said, because I was elected in the by-election, she said, Doug, I know you campaign on the need for rural development, so you're going to be working on it. And I got very excited, and I did that for four years. It was uh, very exciting. Before that, I was a teacher. And that's why I'm not standing in front of the podium, because quite frankly, as a teacher, I like to walk around. Rather than sitting behind the desk, my students would pass notes. I walked around, they stopped. <laughs> ah, you guys can pass notes here. Better than that. But I, I, I feel better when I'm moving around. And I tend to be a little bit animated, so uh, please indulge me. Now, I want to thank you all first. Uh, I want to extend my appreciation for the invitation. This is not my job as the MLA. I don't work on rural development, although I will always work on rural development. It's not official. I, I used to do this speech quite a bit. I've done it over 100 times. And my best, I, then I was, I didn't, I quit doing it. But my best friend passed away two years ago. And so when I, I kept getting requests to do this speech, I asked people to make a donation to his two sons who are now 10 and 7 to their trust fund. And uh, I just, I was saying, I just found out yesterday that so far we've raised $19,500 for the two boys. And I want to thank you for your contribution. Okay. I have a lot to talk about. <laughs> there, I've, I've gathered so many anecdotal stories, I have to pick and choose which ones. So if I start to talk fast, it's because there's a whole lot of great stories I want to tell you. But I, I know our, our time is limited. So when I was first elected, I was assigned to work on rural development. There are 422 communities in Alberta, and I traveled all over the place at the behest of Shirley McCollin to find out what was working and what wasn't working, what success stories we had, what we didn't have, and to write a report to come up with rural development, a rural development strategy. Because she pointed out that we have had agricultural strategies in this province for 100 years, but we've never actually had a rural strategy. So we wrote a report called Rural Alberta Land of Opportunity came out about four years ago. In there, there were 72 recommendations that covered health, education, community infrastructure, economic development, youth, seniors, tourism, aboriginals, arts and culture, water, transportation, infrastructure. <sighs> it was great. It covered everything. It wasn't specific to agriculture. It covered rural. And then Shirley asked me to travel around and tell everybody about it. So I traveled around to everybody <coughs> giving speeches about rural development and what communities needed to do. I told them what they needed to do when it came to education, healthcare, community infrastructure, economic development, youth, seniors, tourism, arts and culture, aboriginals, right? Told them what they needed to do. I emphasized at every single speech I gave, at the beginning of the speech and at the end of the speech, that though the province, the municipalities, the federal government all needed to work together to lay the foundation for rural development, it was up to communities to make sure rural development happened. I emphasized that at the beginning of every speech and at the end. It was at the beginning of the report and the end of the report. And so I was on my way to a community I will refer to as Omega Town. Okay, it's just a, it's not one community, it's a compilation of a bunch of communities and examples. So I was on my way to Omega Town for the third time to go talk about health, education, community infrastructure, economic development, youth, seniors, tourism, arts and culture, aboriginals, water, you name it, okay? To tell them what they needed to do. Try and give them some inspiration. And on my way for the third time to that community, I suddenly was not relishing the thought of going to give that speech because I, every single time I'd given that speech, both times before, I had told the community, it's up to you if you want to be successful. Because quite frankly, I could come in with a generic strategy on rural development for that community around health, education, community infrastructure, right? You've got the list. I could come up with a list. I could even come up with some money, which we did with the Alberta Rural Development Fund. But it was my idea, and it was generic. And unless the people within the community decided they wanted to be successful, as soon as the money ran out, that would be it. But twice I went there to speak at Omega Town, and twice within six weeks, they phoned me and said, Doug, when are we going to see some results from this rural development strategy? Nothing's happening in town. <laughs> and they missed the point that they had to start something. I couldn't do it for them. So then I had an epiphany. I was a teacher, as Jason mentioned. Okay? I would go into high school classes and talk to high school kids about being successful. And every time I was done, I felt like they sort of patted me on the head, not literally, but metaphorically. 
and smile and say thank you very much Mr. Griffiths and walk out. So I changed my presentation. Instead, <coughs> I asked the students, standing up in the front, to name me ways to fail at life. Not to be successful, we could all know what to do to be successful. How to fail. So they'd start to put up their hands and they'd say, well, I'd become a drug addict. I'd get pregnant or get someone pregnant before I was ready. I would fail out of school so I couldn't get a good job. And I would write these things on the board. And then I would ask them, okay, imagine your goal is to fail. That's what you want to do. You want to do one of these things. How would you start today? So take number one, become a drug addict. If you wanted to become a drug addict because your goal was to fail in life, how would you start today? High school kids. So somebody would put up their hand and say, well, if I wanted to become a drug addict, I'd smoke a joint this weekend. And two kids would turn red because that's what they'd done last weekend. <laughs> I'd say, okay, how about the next one? Get pregnant. How would you start today? Of course, they'd all turn red. <laughs> I'd go on to the next one. How would you fail out of school? If you wanted to start today, and someone would say, well, I'd fail the math test we have tomorrow, and suddenly there was this urgent, I have to study. Are you done? <laughs> the point is every single one of us has hopes, dreams, goals, ambitions. Every single one of us, for ourselves and for our community. Okay? But we all do things day to day that undermine those hopes and dreams and goals. We don't do it on purpose. We're not trying to ruin our lives, but we do make decisions sometimes that don't coincide with our hopes and dreams. Communities do the same thing. <clears throat> they come up with great plans and strategies and, and a plan for the future, hopes and dreams and goals for the community, and then they make decisions day to day that undermine their chance for success. So on my way to Omega Town, I was, this will be illegal now, but I was, I was writing down ways that I'd seen, <laughs> seen communities destroying themselves. And so I went, I gave that, that was the very first speech, it was about 15 minutes long because I sort of went through the list, I didn't have a lot of stories. <clears throat> and this is the compilation. Now, a few warnings before I start, there is no magic to the number 13, it just, <laughs> it's just what I came up with before I pulled into town. And it's been that way ever since. You can probably come up with 20 more, and that's great. I hope you do. Okay? You also need to know, I mentioned Omega Town, the compilation of the list. I always have someone come up to me after I give one of these speeches, even though I give this warning, that says, it's a great idea, Doug. We really like some of the stuff you talked about. <clears throat> as soon as we return to prosperity, because we have this global economic downturn. As soon as we return to prosperity, we'll get it done. <laughs> no, you won't. No, you won't. Not one person ever in life when they're successful changes what they're doing. Why would you? You're already successful. It's when you're down on your luck, when you have tough times, that's when you make changes. I think the phrase is never waste a good crisis to make change. Really. So this is the chance, the opportunity you have to change your community and lastly, no matter what I talk about, I want you to keep this in mind. Even if it seems like I'm talking about infrastructure or anything else, it's not. Every single one of the 13 ways to kill your community is about attitude. That's it. They, it manifests itself through discussions about infrastructure or other things, but it's always about attitude. All right, let's begin. Number one, don't have good Quality or quantity of water. I don't think Richard's here. <coughs> Are you? Richard just gave me a tour. You guys have the Water Institute here in Lethbridge. That was a, that's a fantastic building. That's got to be one of Alberta's best kept secrets right now. Needs to be talked about. <coughs> so, 422 communities in Alberta, and I've been to over 300. I don't mean 300 communities sometimes twice. I mean 300 different distinct communities around Alberta. I've been to Zama City and Pincher Creek and <laughs> everywhere in between. And it has been an amazing experience. Now I bet you, you could blindfold me, take me into a community, sit me down at a kitchen table, take a glass of water from the tap, put it in front of me and take the blindfold off. I can, based on the glass of water, pretty much every time describe to you what the community is like. If the water is good, it's crisp, it's clean, it's got no spell, it's got no gases, it's just good quality water, I almost bet you I will walk out into Main Street, I will see new businesses, I'll see new houses, I'll see communities in bloom, I'll see all sorts of good stuff, a vibrant, thriving town. But if I take the blindfold off and that water is 
yellow or has a bad smell or has too much gas or has a bad taste or anything like that. I almost bet you I'll walk out into that community and I'll see closed up boarded businesses, empty buildings on Main Street, small deteriorating houses, unkempt yards, a town that looks like it's dying. The reason why is because people demand good quality water. No, I have got to remember to quit saying that. Nobody demands good quality water anymore, they just expect it. They don't even say, I want good quality water. They just won't tolerate anything less. If you don't believe me, when you get home, go over to the gas station, buy a cup of coffee and just sit up at the counter for 20 minutes. You will hear every single person, pretty much, come in after they fill up with gas, complaining they paid oh, a dollar, a dollar ten a liter for gas, but they'll pay three dollars for a 400 milliliter bottle of water. It's really just quality tap water. That's because people expect good quality water. Now, we also know that quantity of water is critical to communities. I don't know if this report has ever been released publicly. I've been an MLA for eight years. It was a couple of years old when I started, so it's got to be 10 years old now. It's an economic development study from the province that I saw. And it compared the southern part of the province, here where you have irrigation districts, to the east side of the province where I'm from, where we don't. Before there was irrigation. The size of the farms were getting larger, the farm cash gate receipts were getting less and less, there was less employment. It was just a bad economic situation for agriculture. They introduced irrigation, they compared them again. The farms here were getting smaller, employing more people, had more diversified crops, had higher farm gate receipts, and there was more value-added production going with those diversified crops. And the agricultural situation is much more prosperous here than it is on the east side of the province where I'm from. It was interesting, because you had water. <clears throat> there was a little addendum to the report which I found fascinating. I don't think anybody paid enough attention to it. It predicted within 20 years, which would be 10 more years from now, that the value of irrigation, having the water present down here, there would be greater economic value to another sector of the economy than even to agriculture. You know what it was? Tourism. That's right. Tourism. Because of boating and RVing and camping and bird watching and you name it, all the stuff that went along, and it was quickly catching up when I checked, when I first got elected to confirm with the report. So, and you know, we have, we have communities in this province right now. You've just heard about one that came out, had to stop a subdivision. We have communities right now that can't do new subdivisions because they don't have access to enough water. So if you want to kill your community, don't have good quality or quantity of water. Number two, don't attract businesses that will compete. Don't attract businesses, especially those that will compete with yours. I found it really interesting traveling all over the province. I did a little informal comparison of communities of 1,000 to 1,500 people, okay, with grocery stores. I found communities of 1,500 people with one grocery store and communities of 1,500 people with two grocery stores. And I would always go in and walk up and down Main Street businesses, ask them how things were going, and it struck me that a community of 1,500 people with one grocery store, the grocery store owner always said stuff like, oh, Times are tough here, I can barely make a living, I don't know if I can support my family, it's really bad. I'd say, do you think we need another grocery store here? And they'd say, oh no, I can, did you hear me? Well, I can barely make a living. But I would go to communities of 1,500 people with two grocery stores, and the owners almost every single time said, yeah, things are going pretty good. That seems completely counterintuitive, right? 1,500 people in town, one grocery store owner, he's got 1,500 clients. 1,500 people splitting between two grocery stores, they only each have 750. How can the ones that have half as many clients be doing better? Uh, then it struck me, another epiphany, I have those regularly. They're valuable to me. Competition. Two grocery stores in a town of 1,500 people, there was competition. Competition gives us price, quality, selection, and service. With no competition, you don't get price, quality, selection, and service. There's no incentive to do that. It's not the grocery store owner's fault that he's alone or she's alone with no competition. There's just no incentive to compete. <coughs> so I would ask people where there were two grocery store owners, and they would tell me, oh yeah, I go get all my, my meat and dairy products over there because they're fresh, vegetables. Over there, I get all my canned goods because they have the best price, competition. So in a town of 1,500 people with one grocery store, the grocery store owner did not get 1,500 clients. The grocery store owner got three or 400 clients. 
just people who would pick up the necessities because they knew they didn't get the best price, the best quality, the best selection, the best service. Most of them would pick up the necessities, but if they headed out of town, they would go get the grocery somewhere else where there was competition. Namely, in the town with 1,500 people that had two grocery store owners. And that's why the two grocery store owners in 15, with 1,500 people had competition. They had people coming in from out of town and they were doing very well. <clears throat> now, in Omega Town, <laughs> This was one community. I was in a community talking to a very young man who owned the fast gas in town. And I was very, he was, I was asking him, you know, I found out he lived, he was actually from an hour away and I asked him why he wouldn't open up the fast gas in his home community. And he said because I ran into too many obstacles. He planned on opening it in his home community, but he couldn't get development permits, he couldn't get, uh, uh, land rezoned, he couldn't get construction permits, he couldn't get anybody to help him. The town eventually wouldn't even phone him back. They seemed to find him annoying. So he packed up and went an hour down the road and built a fast gas and did it in, after fooling around for a year with his hometown, he went to the other community. He had the building built and running in a year. So I was curious. I went over to that community and asked them, asked around. I wanted to find out why he had so much trouble. Seems he was the only one that didn't know why there was so much trouble. <clears throat> When I asked around, people said, yeah, yeah, we know he had trouble. The reason why he had so much trouble was because the mayor of the town at that time owned the fast gas across the street from where he wanted to build his, or owned the shell across the street from where he wanted to build his fast gas and didn't want the competition. Strangely, it's the only gas station in town, still. And everyone complained about the mayor's gas tax when I was there. I asked them, you know, municipalities cannot tax gasoline. That's, they said, no, 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 he's the mayor and he owns a gas station and he adds on a premium because he knows there's no competition. <laughs> so I asked around more in the same community what the circumstances were. For other, and I found out another guy, young man, wanted to build a bumper to bumper in the same community. Couldn't get the development permits, couldn't get the licensing, couldn't get the rezoning, couldn't get anything done. Finally packed up, went 20 miles down the road to another community and built his bumper to bumper there. Turns out the mayor of the day at that time owned the Acklands, or managed the Acklands, didn't want the competition. So it, suddenly it was like being a confession, because there were people phoning me up and coming to see me at the motel and dropping in to have lunch. I gotta tell you something. One lady came up, she said, I was a town secretary for 20 years, and I have to tell you, we had, we had welders come all the time. They showed up every day. This is a great business sector, great industrial area. I want to build a welding shop. I need some industrial land. I want to hire some welders. This is great. She'd say, she confessed to me, she'd say, we have a downturn in the economy. We don't have any industrial land for sale. You don't want the industrial land. It's contaminated. There's nothing happening here. You don't want to be here. And try and chase them out. I asked her, why would you do that? She said, well, my husband was a welder. <laughs> I didn't want the competition. All in one community. And ironically, that community would phone me up and say, what do we have to do to attract businesses to this town? <clears throat> so if you want to kill your community, don't attract businesses, especially ones that will compete with yours, and then everyone can leave town, spend their money elsewhere, and your community can die. Number three, don't involve youth. <clears throat> now, I, <laughs> I like this talking about youth, because when I was first elected, I was 29. I looked like I was 17, and I was campaigning in this lodge. They'd asked me to come and talk to them, and I was sitting there talking to this wonderful lady for about 20 minutes. And after we, I was done answering all her questions, I said, so can I count on your support? And she looked at me and smiled and patted me on the knee and said, are you old enough to vote? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, of course, look 17 anymore, thankfully, but. So everyone always asks me, Doug, youth, what do we have to do to keep youth in our community? And I always get this Im image of being on Main Street, where there's youth strapped to the light standards. You can't keep youth in your community. You don't want to keep youth in your community. It's the completely wrong attitude. The attitude to take with youth is not to try and keep them there. The attitude you should have is creating a community that they want to return to. Quite frankly, if they don't leave, the nature of youth is to go off and explore, learn. If they don't leave, they don't learn anything else but what's within your community. And then what are they going to, you want them to go out, get experience and come back and bring their new ideas with them. <coughs> so the trick is not to keep them, the trick is to give them a reason to come back. So youth bring energy and ideas to your community. I have not found, 
No, I did. I found one local government that was doing succession planning for town and county council. Now we do succession planning, tax experts are going all over the province, all over the nation, doing succession planning for agriculture so that there's something to pass on to the next generation and that government doesn't get everything. I'm a self-hating politician. Uh, but local government, I found one local government that was doing succession planning for their community. I actually have had councillors come up to me and say, I don't know why you talk about succession planning. They can wait until they're 40 like I did before they get involved. I've actually had people say that. <coughs> I have yet to find any community in this province that is doing succession planning for Main Street businesses. In agriculture, the average age of farmers is 57 years old. We're concerned about the future of agriculture because of that. You go to a lot of small communities, I'll almost bet you the average age of small business owners in small communities is pretty close to the same age. I would go down Main Street, like I said, and visit with business owners and ask them, what are you going to do with your business when you're done? Well, I'd ask them, what are you going to do when you're done, when you retire? And they'd talk, start talking about golf and travel and stuff. But I'd ask them, no, no, with your business. And they'd give me this confused look, like, what do you mean? I was going to lock it. That's it. I did work experience when I was in high school. I did three years in a row. And I am the best damn floor sweeper this province has ever seen. <laughs> in fact, there are a whole lot of people that I graduated with who are going to be fighting for the same warehouse job if I don't get elected again. No, I'm just joking. I have other opportunities. But <clears throat> there we sit with, with work experience in communities, with communities that need the succession plan for those businesses. The two aren't put together. Winkler, Manitoba, if you ever get a chance to go there or talk to them, they have a YouTube video you can even watch. The town council, the county council, and the Economic Development Authority meet with and interview all the grade 11 and 12 students every single year. Find out what they're interested, what they want to do, where they plan on going, what education they're going to take. And they will tell you, they take it upon themselves, their own personal responsibility, if they have 50 grads, to create 50 jobs or business opportunities for those grads. No business opportunities, not just jobs. Their notion is they're not all going to stay. We actually want them to go away and we want to give them a reason to come back. The consequence of doing what they have is that there are all the communities within 100 miles, they attract the youth because of the jobs and business opportunities that they've created in that community. And the population in that community in 15 years has doubled. And it's the youngest community in all of Manitoba. So, uh, I have so many stories, but I... So if you want to uh, kill your community, don't involve or engage youth. Number four, don't assess community needs. Every single community out of the 422 in Alberta has some weakness. I don't care if it's got poor transportation, a poor community spirit, they think they need an arena paid for by the provincial, I don't care, they're lacking something. Or maybe it's a daycare or a school or a, I, don't, I don't know. Every community lacks something. Not one is perfect. But every single one of our 422 communities in this province has some competitive advantage over the others. Or nobody would live there. It might be the quality of the school, it might be the quality of the church, it might be the community organizations, it might be the sports team, it might be, who knows? It might be the fact that your family has lived there for generations. But you're there, and so that community has some competitive advantage to attract people to it. Well, <laughs> if you want to kill your community, don't assess your needs. Your strengths, which you can sell and advertise to the rest of the world, or your weaknesses, which you can fix. I gave this speech and this community said, we want to do that. We want to model it for you. So they did it. <clears throat> they did a needs assessment. They got the seven people of influence. There's a difference between people of power and people of influence. People of power have positions like MLAs, mayors, doctors, well, no, doc. but they have positions of power. Doesn't necessarily mean they're people of influence. People of influence don't always occupy the positions of power. In fact, I'm sorry, guys. <clears throat> If you do a, a strict analysis of your community and the people who have influence, you'll find it's primarily women because they're the social network in most communities. And so they have more influence. If they decide something wants to get done, they, they tell it gets done. <laughs> so <clears throat> they found the seven people of influence in this small community. They got them together and they did up two lists, a list of all their weaknesses, things they needed to fix, and they prioritized them from the easiest one to fix to the hardest one and all the things that were great about the community. And it was neat because they said they discovered things about the community everyone's forgotten. 
It's like driving by that barn every day for 20 years and you, you don't even see it until one day it's gone. Then you recognize it. So they put together all the list of good things that people had forgotten about. <coughs> they put them up in the town office. The good list, they put right on the back wall so everyone who came in to pay their power bill or visited the town saw the good list and they could remember, oh yeah, that's a great thing about town. The bad list they put around the back behind the coffee maker. But the seven people of influence started to talk about what? The lists that they made up. And word spread very quickly. Within one week, and somebody told me it was at the behest of their wives, a couple of guys came in, said, where's this list of all the things wrong with our town? Walked around behind the coffee maker and saw it. Number one, the slide in the playground needs to be painted. What? This I said, this is easy. We'll take care of that on Saturday. Forget it. And they, they did. Three of them bought a case of beer, went down to the playground on Saturday, and painted the slide. <laughs> the guy said it was great. Because, Honey, I'm doing community service. I got to go. <laughs> and you know what? They had a couple other guys show up because they thought it was fun to get the next one on the list. And then the next one. And each one, a new, new people came to the group, and they took on a bigger project. And because they started small, they had success, and they kept building on the success. And they said the worst part about doing that, they have nothing left on the list to fix. And they have an entire community now that has a reputation that they can fix anything. And they have a fantastic volunteer base. <clears throat> doing a needs assessment, I've got to add this in here, also means assessing your community's values. I have to emphasize this. Everyone thinks when I do this speech that we're talking about growth. That it's always got to be growth. It's not. There are too many communities that have d assumed they, they have to go with the standard stuff, right? We have to do an economic development plan, we have to do a growth plan, we do the needs assessment, we fall in. Well, too many communities, you find out when you go in there, they actually like being small. That's why people live there. And so there's this standard idea, well, if you're not growing and doing an economic development plan, <coughs> You're, you're defeating yourself. No, no, there are, there's one community I met, they had a great tourism base. That tourism base was fantastic. It drew people in, they had a business empire, the, all the businesses built on the tourism that came in. They developed a growth plan because that's what they were supposed to do. They had more people move to the community, it lost a small town atmosphere, there went their tourism. And they completely defeated what was their own strength, something that was great about the community. So when you do a value assessment, you can figure out what communities really value, as opposed to what they assume they're supposed to value. So if you want to kill your community, don't do a needs assessment. Number five, shop elsewhere. Every Chambers of Commerce talks about shopping local. It's important to shop local. Every dollar you spend in town touches seven other hands before it leaves. So it's critical. Every dollar spent out of town is gone for good. Shop local. Too many, I hate to call them consumers, but too many consumers in our local community forget that. Or they, they let their emotions get the better of them. And one particular emotion. Look, okay, when a business sets up in town, this applies, the longer you've lived in town, the more likely this three-step process to opening a business applies to you, okay? If you were born in that town, you're gonna laugh and cry when I describe this. If you're new to town, you'll probably be fairly successful at opening a business, but then we get to number 11 and we talk about outsiders, you'll you get other problems. <clears throat> Step number one, business opens up in town. Local person opens it up. Everyone in the coffee shop starts talking about it and they say, <clears throat> why would somebody open up a business like that? That's a stupid investment. They're gonna lose their money. I'm not gonna shop there. You know, I buy my stuff there. Where am I gonna get my services and supplies after that? I'm not gonna shop there, that's ridiculous. And they won't shop there. And the conversation in the coffee shop is to keep people from shopping there. Step number two, phase number two, the business is still open. It's actually maybe even succeeding. And then people in the coffee shop start saying, do you see his new golf clubs? Did you see the new house they're building? He got a new car. She's got a big diamond ring. I'm not shopping there. I'm not going to make him rich. And they'll drive 20 miles down the road to make someone else rich, but not somebody in the community. And then phase number three, the business either goes broke or it gets bought out by a bigger one that's not a locally owned business anymore, so your dollars leave town when you buy the shop there. Or they move to a larger community where they're appreciated. And then they phone me up and say, Doug, what do we have to do to keep businesses in town? <laughs> now that's all based on jealousy. Jealousy is the most evil 
Of all human traits, there are. Jealousy is illogical and irrational, but it is jealousy because you, someone opens a business, you're jealous they opened a business. So you do everything you can, even though you won't admit it, you do everything you can to make that business unsuccessful because you're jealous. They're successful. You don't like the cars, the Jaguar, the house, the rings, the golf clubs. Jealous. You don't want to shop there. And it's completely irrational because that, that feeling of jealousy when you don't want them to succeed hurts you. It's completely irrational. You want people in town to make money because the more money they make, the more they can donate, the more they spend, the more people they hire, the more the community is successful. But if you want them to fail, that's what jealousy is. You don't want them to make money. You don't want them to get the new car. You don't want them to hire more people in town. Eventually, the business goes broke. Business goes broke, that's less money spent in town. That can lead to another business closing. Eventually, it will get you too, which makes it completely illogical and irrational. However, it's not just the consumers that are to blame. I have yet to find any chamber of commerce in this province or anywhere else. They always talk about shopping locally. I have yet to see one of them doing uh, any sort of professional development for businesses about giving people a reason to want to shop locally. I actually had one guy come up and tell me, you know, you'd think it was a hardship that I show up in town to buy anything from anybody. You get the experience where I walk in and they turn like I'm on a phone call or they're grumpy, you don't get the service. I had one guy tell me he actually thought that sometimes the price he paid for goods was dependent on the owner's mood. I had another gentleman come up to me. He said every morning he had to show up in the same business to buy some supplies. Every single morning. Wednesday morning was the worst. Small town, him and his son played hockey every Tuesday night. The service he got was dependent on whose boy won. He said I would show up and if his boy won, it was like gloating. Ha 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 ha. But I get my stuff with a smile, <laughs> a gloating smile. If my boy won, I waited an extra 20 minutes. Pretty sure I pay, paid more. I got no service. What makes me want to shop locally? So if you want to kill your community, shop elsewhere. Encourage people to shop elsewhere. Money will leave town and your community will slowly go broke and die. Number six, don't paint. <clears throat> uh, everyone laughs at this one. It sounds so superficial, right? Don't paint. Don't sweep, don't dust, don't do anything to beautify your community. It sounds so superficial. It's kind of akin to judging a book by the, its cover. <laughs> but quite frankly, a lot of books get read based on the cover. It is meaningful. I, uh, I always like to use, look, community's outward appearance, that aesthetics, that attractiveness, is the first sign of a community's success or failure. Imagine a Leopard, female leopard, walks out of the jungle. She's looking for a mate. There's one male leopard over there and one male leopard over there. So she stacks them up and she looks at this male leopard and he's clean cut and he's got nice hair, shiny coat, bright eyes, sharp nails, gleam, you know, just looking to smile. Okay. And there's another leopard over here and he's limping, got pus coming out of his eyes. <laughs> mangy hair, broken tail, which one do you think she's going to be attracted to? This is not Paris Hilton, right? She's not superficial, but that first appearance is the most outward telling sign of, of the animal's success, its ability to be a good provider. Communities are the same way. That first impression, that beauty, is the first sign of whether a community is successful and believes in itself or whether it's failing and doesn't believe in itself. So we're all attracted to aesthetically pleasing things. It's not just leopards. You, you pull into a community, it's going to be your reaction, depending on what you see. <clears throat> You're only Paris Hilton if you start off superficial and that's all you... She's going to sue me someday when I'm doing this speech, but that's <laughs> if you just stay superficial. But everyone's... <laughs> look, how many of you have ever been to a dance? You're standing there at the dance, looking around, look across the room, make eye contact and think, I've got to go ask that person out. Are they ever ugly? <laughs> You ever walk onto a car lot and say, I want to see the, the most rundown piece of garbage you got on the lot? No, you don't do that with a house when you buy it. We all want to be surrounded by aesthetically pleasing things. After we get over the initial impression, that's when we get down to deep meaning. But that first impression means a lot. My wife's going to kill me. But look, <laughs> my wife, I, we were looking for a new vehicle. And I told her, I mean, I drive over 100,000 kilometers a year. So I told her, have a look around 
when we're driving and tell me what you see. So she looks around, she starts pointing out vehicles on the road. I like this one, I like that one. I told her, tell me what you like. So I like this, I like that. I got the impression she liked the Ford Explorer. So we went to the Ford dealership, pulled up. I liked the color, it was brown, it had good tires on it and everything. So as soon as she looked at it, she said, uh-uh, that's not what I wanted. That, that's what you pointed at most of the time. So we, I said, well, look again, point out. She kept pointing at vehicles again. I realized she wasn't pointing at Ford Explorers. She was pointing at silver ones. <laughs> now, she's not superficial. She doesn't know that much about vehicles. So she just, I said, tell me what you like. So she was pointing at one she liked. After that, we talked about the utility. But her first impression, she wanted something that was appealing. I like to say that's why she stuck with me. <laughs> so if you want to kill your community, don't paint. Number seven, don't cooperate. There are three ways. Okay, first, don't cooperate as an organization. Don't cooperate with the other organizations in your community. It will help fail. But quite frankly, those other organizations will realize you're not going to cooperate, and they'll go work on their own anyway. Some of their success will spill over to you, and you'll still be successful, perhaps, in the end. It's really a passive way to fail. You can be more aggressive if you want which means compete with the other organizations. Don't just not cooperate, compete with them. Compete for the same grants, the same volunteer dollars, the same volunteers, the same anything. Compete. In Omega Town, there were four community organizations, 2,500 people in this town, four community organizations all wanted to build a town hall. <laughs> they all wanted to build their own town hall. So they competed. All four of them, they applied for the same grants, they fought for the same volunteers, they tried to get the same community fundraising dollars, everything. And for 10 years, nothing happened. None of them ever raised enough money, none of them ever got organized enough and managed to keep themselves from building a town hall. Eventually, two of the organizations went broke, the other two partnered. When they finally partnered and cooperated, they had a town hall built within a year. So if you want to kill your community, don't cooperate or be even more aggressive and compete. Or <laughs> there's another way that's even better. And it's very devious. It takes a lot of practice, but it was incredibly effective. You have to become what I would call a volunteer vampire. Okay? This is the, the volunteer vampires are very successful at killing your community because they take some project you want, say it's a town hall. And they say, well, I would love to help with that. I'll champion it, in fact. And they say, well, great, you go ahead and do it. Organize the volunteers. And then the volunteer vampire is the head, sucks the life out of every single idea that comes forward. <laughs> Somebody says, oh, we should, uh, we should have a fundraising supper. And the volunteer vampire will say, are you kidding? There's so many things going on. We're going to conflict with three different events. Nobody's going to come to ours because it's not the most important. And then they're going to have to pay money for this. And, they're gonna... and the person actually says, you're right, that was a bad idea. Thank you for stopping me. Somebody else says, uh, well, let's have a door-to-door -door fundraising drive. Door-to-door -door fundraising, are you kidding? Our volunteers are tapped for all sorts of projects. They're just getting tired and energy, and who's got any money? We can't get money out of them. We're gonna, everybody gets asked for money. There's been people that show up every day asking for money, and you're gonna ask for more, that's not gonna work. <sighs> you're right, that, that could have been a big mistake. Why don't we apply for some government grants? Are you kidding? The cities hire everybody. They get professionals filling out those grants. They're 50 pages. We're never going to do it. I don't know how to fill those things out. Do you know how to fill those things out? It's going to take forever. Oh, you're right. What a waste of time. And eventually, if you do it well enough, as a volunteer vampire, slowly sucking the life out of every idea, people will thank you for it. That's the most devious. You kill the project and you still get thanked for it. In fact, there was one community I found they almost named Volunteer Appreciation Day after what they gave me the coin, the most powerful vol uh, vamp volunteer vampire they'd ever met. So they actually got it stopped. Because this person was in every committee, and they discovered that every committee she was on, nothing had happened for 10 years that she was involved in. Very powerful volunteer vampire. So if you want to kill your community, don't cooperate. Number eight, live in the past. Wherever I go, I meet, and you will too, the people who want to live in the past. They do it in one of two ways. Whenever you're talking about ideas, talking about the future of your community, talking about success, anything like that, they will redirect the conversation to something in the past. That's the whole point. It's to keep you from looking forward. They do it in one of two ways. They either start talking about the good old days. It was so good back then. 
Why are we doing this now? We just need to go back to what we did. This is creating all the problems, right? You want to, it doesn't matter what you do. They, they're very nice. They're usually very friendly. They're not angry. They just start reminiscing about the good old days and take it back. Or they're very angry and they hold on to something in the past that they will not let go of and you cannot move forward or do anything until it's rectified. It could be, you know, what you did to, or your grandma did to somebody's uncle back in 1906, right? I'm not working with them. You know what they did to my, no way. And until that's rectified, they won't help, they won't contribute, and they won't let anybody forget it. Or, I was working on this rural development strategy. I had a community meeting with 20 people there from all walks of life to talk about health, education, community infrastructure, economic development, youth, seniors, aboriginals, tourism, arts and culture, water. See, I can do it anytime. <laughs> and this gentleman stood up. I thought he was very progressive minded at first, but he stood up and said, you guys have got to fix the price of natural gas. Since it was deregulated, it's a disaster. I found out it was deregulated a year after I was born. <laughs> but it was, <laughs> right, but he wanted it fixed and the price of natural gas was high. And I said, well, sir, we're, we're working on it. We're coming, we're putting together some programs like the natural gas rebate. We're working on it, we're doing our best. Now, can we go back to the conversation about health, education? He said, no, none of that will matter and nothing will get fixed until you fix the natural gas situation. I said, well, can we discuss something else today? Because take it up, no. Until you fix it, nothing will happen. I finally had to ask him to leave the meeting. But his point was that, my point, is that he was focused on one thing that was wrong and nothing would progress until that was fixed. So if you want to kill your community, live in the past. Number nine, ignore your seniors. Youth bring energy and ideas. Seniors bring time and money. They bring other things, but they bring time and money. Okay? Seniors help build our communities. This province is only 105 years old come this September. Lots of our seniors help build these communities from nothing. So when they retire, they want to go golf a little bit, do stuff, but after a couple years, they come back, they want to volunteer again. They want to spend some time with their friends, they want something to do, so they want to volunteer. Oftentimes, they don't feel like they're welcome. But communities that are successful have pulled together huge volunteer bases of seniors and been very effective. Seniors also have money. Now, this does not mean you get them investing in every harebrained scheme you have in your community or that you expect them to contribute to every fundraiser dinner? No. No, we get the impression seniors are about to die. They're not. They're about to live. They're 65. They don't have to have one or two jobs and the kids and everything else that is involved. They worked their whole lives so that now they can retire and live. And if they have some money, and some of them do have money, don't get me wrong, they're not all wealthy, but neither are they all poor, or Florida, Phoenix, and Camrose would not be booming with all the seniors moving there. <laughs> they have money and they want a quality of life, and if they don't get it in your community, they'll go somewhere else to get it. My grandpa retired from the farm, went to Phoenix every winter. You know why he went to this one little community, Apache Junction in Phoenix? Because they had square dancing. And he and his girlfriend, my grandma passed away before I was born. It's not like he, no. <laughs> he was frisky, but not that frisky. <laughs> Square dancing, when they couldn't go down to the States anymore, they didn't move back to the farm or into our community. They moved to Viking. You know why they moved to Viking? Because they had square dancing, and that's what they wanted to do. So if you want to kill your community, ignore your seniors. I know I'm, 11, 10, nothing new. <laughs> Too many stories to tell, I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm scraping. All right, number 10, nothing new. I could also call this be short-sighted or keep your thoughts within sight of the water tower. I went, uh, yeah. When I was first elected, it was by-election, I was single, I drove all over the province, I lived in my car, it was April. By October, my parents said, you look a little tired, you need to get a break, you need a holiday. So uh, you better plan one, if not, you're coming to Mexico with us in January. And I thought, yeah, okay, I better plan a holiday. But I didn't get around to it. <laughs> so come Christmas, I never had a stocking before. Mom smiled, go get your stocking. So I pulled out the stocking, thinking this is kind of juvenile. And there was a ticket to Mexico to go with my folks. They also attached the bill. They weren't paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> they just said I was going with them. But you know, my folks are young, I get along with them great. I thought it would be a blast. And they were going with a bunch of friends. So I went for a week, and it was fun, except there was one guy that's a friend of my dad's. I 
I couldn't figure him out because he didn't. We got there, we weren't there a day, and he didn't like the Mexican beer, he didn't like the Mexican food, he didn't like the Mexican water, he didn't like the Mexican sun, he didn't like the Mexican whip, he didn't like anything about Mexico. And I thought, I asked my dad, why on earth would he come? And he said, son, he's 65 and he's never been out of the sight of the water tower before. I had a vision that, you know, he's driving down the road, oh, can't see the water tower, turn around and go home. <laughs> Often many of our communities think that way. They keep their thoughts within sight of the water tower. They do everything that's always been done within sight of the water tower. They don't look for other ideas. Have you ever been to a meeting and come up with an idea and somebody looks at you and this is an explanation, a reason for not doing it. They look at you and say, well, we've never done that before. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> Einstein, I think it was Einstein, described insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results every time. And so many of our communities are absolutely insane. And they don't need to be. There are rural development institutes all over the globe now that advertise success stories. There are communities that advertise success stories because for them, they advertise it, that draws people to their community. So they want to brag. You don't have to take something brand new no one's ever thought of before. <clears throat> I failed out of the U of A my first year. It was a really good year. <laughs> and another gentleman failed out with me. So we both went to Red Deer College, and then when we got, I actually went back to the U of A after, and he didn't. He finished uh, the first half of Red Deer College, took his tuition money and everything he had, and went off and invested. He took, he took uh, a spring break class at the, or spring break, it's not a class, which it was, but. <laughs> He took spring break and he went down to a Midwest American town for spring break. It's pretty famous. Promised me I wouldn't, I promised him I wouldn't say. And he stuck around there for reading week. Spring break and reading week didn't quite fully overlap, so he had a couple days of spring break and then he was there by himself. Sat up on the second story of this little restaurant pub out on the balcony, had a couple of beers and watched down at this business. And this business, he said, was packed all the time while all the students were there for spring break. But when all the students left, it was still packed all the time. And he realized in this community, it was the same size of community that he had come from in Alberta. It had the similar agricultural base as where he had come from. Everything was very similar, except his town didn't have that business. So he took his savings and he went and he opened that business. And it was a huge success. He just took exactly what he saw and put his name on it. Now all he does, <clears throat> he actually asked me if I would go into business with him and I said, no, my parents will kill me, I've got to finish school. Now he's got a couple Jaguars, <laughs> and I don't. But he owns half a dozen businesses. They're all different, and all he does is travel around and find somewhere where a business was successful in a community that's similar to one now across Western Canada, because he's expanded his purview, and he just supplants it. I asked him, the best quote I ever got was from him. And he said, everyone, my dad always told me, learn from your mistakes, if you can, learn from other people's mistakes. It's cheaper that way. He said, I figured out I'd rather learn from other people's successes and mirror it. So that's what he does. If you want to kill your community, keep your sights and thoughts within sight of the water tower. Number 11, ignore immigrants and newcomers. <clears throat> Youth bring energy and ideas. Seniors bring time and money. Immigrants and newcomers bring entrepreneurship and pioneerism. Any of you ever read the book, The Millionaire Mind? There's a chapter in there that talks about immigrants. The whole point to the book is to figure out what millionaires think, what goes on in their mind that's so different from the rest of us that makes them millionaires while we're not, okay? There's a section in there on immigrants and it talks about what makes, best quote, best uh, statistic in there is how half of all new millionaires in North America every year are first generation immigrants that came here with nothing or next to nothing. Seems strange, doesn't it? I mean, we, here we are, we've got university, we've got clean water, we've got everything we could possibly imagine. And yet, immigrants will come from places where it's not about having a choice between three menial jobs, it's having a job. It's not about what kind of food you're gonna eat, whether you can afford McDonald's or Pizza Hut or a steak. It's a question of if your next meal is gonna come. Where, where they have to haul water lots of times and they don't know whether it's clean. Half the world does not have access to clean drinking water. So they come over, 
they come from places where they're worried about getting shot or blown up if they go to vote, but they still go to vote. They come over here, this is the land of opportunity. $5,000 a year for tuition, for an education that's worth $25,000, they don't even have the opportunity for grade six where they come from sometimes. A chance to work, to make yourself better so you can make more money and advance your education and take care of your kids. What a glorious opportunity. We complain if water is going to cost us over $100 a month. The majority of Albertans spend more money than that on cable or satellite TV every month. And for an immigrant that comes over here from a place where they had to haul water, they, $100 a month, they can't believe you just turn the tap and it comes out. It's an amazing feat. Who could possibly not be happy about that? They come over here and they have the chance to vote and it's free. And we can't even get half of the people in Alberta to vote in an election. And most people are given the time off, paid at work to go vote. And we can't even get half of them to vote. It's because we're spoiled, rotten. Albertans, Canadians, and North Americans are absolutely spoiled, rotten. We live in the land of opportunity, and we sit around in the coffee shop and ask, when's the government gonna fix it? When's the MLA gonna fix it? When's the town gonna fix it? When's the economic? Somebody else is gonna fix it. Instead of taking it and fixing it ourselves. <clears throat> So immigrants and newcomers come with that pioneerism, that entrepreneurism where they want to take what little they have, take advantage of the land of opportunity and get more. And that's why half of all new millionaires every year in North America are first generation immigrants that come here with nothing. So if you want to kill your community, chase them and their pioneerism, which we used to have not that long ago, and their entrepreneurial spirit out of your community and you can die. Number 12. Assume you're miles ahead, or also it could be called becomes complacent. I remember uh, Wayne Gretzky, <clears throat> the Oilers had won their first cup the year before. It was just before Christmas. They had just won the game 7-0. They'd only lost three games in the whole season so far. Walking over everybody. Wayne Gretzky's being interviewed. The interviewer leans over and says, hey, you guys won the cup last year. Three losses, you're winning seven nothing, you're walking all over everybody, you guys will win the cup again this year, eh? Wayne Gretzky looked at him and said, it's hard to get on top. It's even harder to stay on top because most everybody will become complacent. And if we assume that we're gonna win the cup this year, we don't try as hard to practice, we don't build our relationships, we don't practice our skills. So no, we have no idea that we're gonna win the cup. We're gonna work damn hard for it, but we don't know that. I'll never forget that, I think I was 12 years old and it was, Never forget that. But so many of us assume we're miles ahead and then we get past. Most communities are spiraling up or down, one way or the other. Too many communities <laughs> talk about being sustainable. Sustainable has come to mean status quo in our train of thought. We think, yeah, we just want to hold on to what we have, right? That's what sustainable means. Let's just, let's just hold on. Status quo. There is no such thing as status quo. And quite frankly, we shouldn't shoot for status quo. I know everybody's doing sustainability uh, reports and initiatives and plans. That means let's hold on to what we have. Nobody's, uh, these are the names you should have. Instead of a sustainability plan and proposal, it should be uh, vibrancy, dynamic, responsive, adaptive, aggressive, enterprising. Things like that. Because I'll tell you what, if you're going to be sustainable, you have to be enterprising, aggressive, adaptive, responsive, dynamic. You have to be those things. But we forget about that. We talk about sustainability as though it's just staying the way we are. We just want to preserve it. Well, sorry, but the world is changing. There is no such thing as just preserving what you have. Communities that have adapted this idea about status quo and sustainability, you can tell them right away because the first thing they do is hire an economic development officer and then abandon them. As though they've, they've, you know, they're just going to reach into the pocket and businesses will start to show up. Hey, we hired an economic development officer. I've seen communities that are paying $18,000 for a part-time economic development officer and they don't do anything with them. Economic development officer has a plan, town or county or somebody counters every single thing they do, which completely defeats the purpose. That economic development officer does not have a list of businesses in their back pocket that mean everyone will show up. Three quarters of our communities have now hired economic development officers. It is not a competitive advantage unless you're going to work with them. So if you want to kill your community, assume you're miles ahead, become complacent. Last one, don't take responsibility. 
I was the MLA for about two and a half years. And we had gone through the worst drought in the province's history in 2002. Sheila McCullen said, don't worry, that's as bad as it'll ever get. And then we had BSE the next year. I think she owes me a drink for that one. And so it was a year after BSC and we were starting to recover and everything was getting better. And I had a gentleman from my constituency phone me, <coughs> used language I've heard of before, I've just never quite heard it put in that combination before. <laughs> he was the maddest man I have ever heard in my life. I never got a word in edgewise. All he did was swear and cuss and complain about everything. He said, I was, I was to blame for everything. There's not enough volunteers in our community. We don't have enough seniors housing. There's not enough, there's no swimming pool. We can't get a swimming pool. There's, I can't make any money on the farm. I don't have enough work to even keep my son busy on the farm. I can't get any truck drivers to haul my cattle now. I, on and on and on, and everything was my fault. And when he was finally done, he just hung up. Now, positive thinking people tend to take a crisis and turn it into an opportunity. Negative thinking people take an opportunity and turn it into a crisis. I once got told the uh, Mandarin word for crisis and opportunity is the same, but if you look it up on the internet, they say it's not. I don't know. Regardless, it's, it all depends on your perspective, which side of the coin you're on. This gentleman had said, not enough work to keep my son busy on the farm. And the next phrase he uttered, and I have a memory like that for conversations, said, I can't get a truck driver to haul my cattle. Now, in my mind, that sounded like a business opportunity. Not enough work on the farm? Start a truck driving business. Because you can bet if you can't find a truck driver, neither can anybody else. Sounds like a great business opportunity. But his point was not to find solutions. His point was to make it all my fault. And the same thing is with, exists within your community. Lots of people ask me, when's the government going to fix it? When's the government going to do it? The government can't fix it. The government cannot suddenly turn all 422 communities into prosperous places. They can set the stage, and there are lots of things I still argue with the government about that they need to fix. It's no doubt. But it's not their responsibility alone. And now, one last comment, if I may. Uh, when I started, Robert knows this, when I started working on rural development eight years ago, we finished that report three years after. About 72 recommendations about health, education, community infrastructure, economic development, youth, seniors, tourism, aboriginals, arts and culture, water infrastructure, okay? When we talked about that, I had people say, that's too big, you're never gonna get it done, it will never work, the whole globe is urbanizing, how are you gonna start ruralizing the communities? Everybody, everybody, from my own colleagues to peoples in the community, told me it won't work, you won't get it done. And in eight years, I haven't got everything done, but I'm not giving up. <clears throat> But when you, you will come across people who will be negative and say it won't work and you can't get it done, just do what I did. Helps you survive. Smile at them, nod, say those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. Thank you. <laughs>